All right, so hello everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger. We're here at the University of New South Wales as a course in differential geometry. And today we're going to look at some classical results proven by three very important French geometers. Uh, their names are Mesnier, Monge, and Dupin. And they all lived around the time of the French Revolution and uh, the rise of Napoleon. And some of their lives were uh, intimately connected with uh, military uh, aspects of that time. So they're uh, very important in the history of the subject. And the first person we'll talk about is uh, Jean-Baptiste Meusnier, who was a soldier. And in fact, he did uh, a lot of his work just as a, a young soldier, as a 20 or one year old soldier. He lived from 1754 to 1793. He didn't live too long. And he died as a general. He became a general in the French uh, army and died in the uh, siege of, uh, of a certain city. He uh, made some important discoveries. He was also rather an innovative fellow. He was. Uh, person who originally thought up the idea of a dirigible, which is a big balloon kind of structure which can move around with a, a canopy and uh, you know, a basket with lots of people. And his original design for such a thing was a 84 uh, meter long dirigible. And I think uh, later on, a few de decades later, people did start to you know, make such things and his design was an important influence uh, on that kind of thing. All right, so let's review the, uh, the state of the art. At this time, Euler had already established the basic aspects of curvature of a surface uh, near a point. So we have some surface uh, S in space. There's a surface. And we have some point uh, P on the surface. Then we know that when we're studying this surface near the point P, uh, first of all, the, probably the most important thing is the tangent plane. So we have the tangent plane at P. And then we have the axis, which is perpendicular to that tangent plane. And that allows us to define normal sections. So we talked about normal sections, which are what you get when you slice the surface with a plane that contains this axis. Okay. So there are then uh, these normal sections. Take a plane like this that contains the axis and it will slice the, uh, the surface in a certain planar curve. And we saw that if we then looked at the curvatures of these planar curves, that as the normal section moved around, there was a rather predictable way in which those uh, normal curvatures uh, moved around. So Euler had established that these normal curvatures had a, a maximum and a minimum value. in two perpendicular directions. which are called the principal directions. And so there's various possibilities uh, there. So uh, one kind of situation is if we have a story something like this locally. So there's the point P and we have one uh, curve like this and another curve like this. So here's a, a story where the two principal uh, curvatures are both positive. In other words, the, uh, the surface itself near P is all on one side of the tangent plane. And this is called an elliptic point. So P here is called an elliptic point. And uh, so the surface locally, S is locally on one side of the tangent plane. Uh, 
And uh, the two principal directions will be perpendicular to each other. So we have uh, those perpendicular directions at the point P. Then there's another situation, uh, maybe I'll draw it over here, a little bit harder to draw, something like this. Uh, point P here, say. And the principal directions now opening up in opposite directions. This is a hyperbolic point. where there's uh, one curvature is basically going on one side of the tangent plane and another principal uh, curve going on the other side of the tangent plane. So in this case, the tangent plane uh, cuts the surface. So the tangent plane would be some plane like this that would cut the surface in two other lines, which maybe I'll put in blue. So these, uh, these other new lines are called the asymptotic directions. So this is where the tangent plane meets, meet of the tangent plane and the surface itself. So for such a hyperbolic point, the things are a little bit more interesting because we have not just the principal directions of maximum and minimum curvature, but also the, these asymptotic lines. And then it's useful to think also about the centers of curvature. So the centers of curvature for these uh, normal sections will all lie on the axis. And for uh, an elliptic point like this, the centers of curvature will vary uh, between some interval, the intervals endpoints corresponding to the centers of curvature of the principal curves. So here are the centers of curvature for the elliptic case. And over here in the hyperbolic case, well, the centers of curvature will be sort of separated. So there will be a center of curvature up here somewhere for the, the curve that's going in this direction. And the curve that's going down here will have a center of curvature down here. And then if we vary the normal sections, well, then the, the curvatures become uh, less and the centers of curvature move up. So in this case, the centers of curvature uh, sort of head in this direction and in this direction and essentially become in infinite when we're in an asymptotic direction where the, the lines are flat and the, the center of the circle is really at infinity. Now together with these two, uh, these are the standard kinds of things that can happen, elliptic point, or hyperbolic point. There's also a situation which is intermediate between them, naturally called the parabolic situation. And let's draw a picture of that too. Keep this one here. So there's also a parabolic situation where we have something like this and uh, point P and then we have curves All right, so here P, P is a parabolic point And that means that one of the principal curvatures is zero. In other words, there's one direction where the surface is locally like a straight line. 
And that's what you get when you fold a piece of paper like this. Then, well, in this case, everything is a, a parabolic point. There are, however, other uh, ways of getting parabolic points. The, the parabolic story is actually a little bit more subtle. There are also more complicated examples of parabolic points. And a famous example of that is so-called monkey saddle. which I'm not sure if I'll be able to uh, draw very well. But the idea is that we're going to take a plane and choose a point and we'll divide the region near that point into six uh, equal sectors. And we'll put mountains or, or hills on three of those sectors. So here's a hill and here's a hill. Mm on this sector, this sector, and on this sector. So here we have hills, a hill, hill, and hill. And on the opposite sectors, there are valleys going down. So under, going down here is a valley, a valley, and a valley. So it's a kind of a saddle with not with uh, two pieces sticking up or like one in front and one in the back, but sort of three. Okay. So you could imagine if you were a monkey, you could perhaps sit here on the saddle and there would be one valley for a leg in this direction to put a leg down and there would be another valley there for another leg to go down. And the valley behind you is for your tail. That's why it's called a monkey saddle. A monkey can sit there comfortably with two legs and a tail, both uh, in a comfortable position. If you take a cross section, any cross section, say like this one here, then uh, what we want is we want a, basically a, a cubic. So imagine a cubic cross section. Cubic cross sections that look like uh, y equals x cubed like this, and that'll guarantee that the tangent at uh, the central point is, is flat. Okay. And that'll guarantee that it's actually a parabolic point. But it's not of uh, this relatively simple kind. And once you've seen that example, okay, then you could say, all right, well, we could divide this thing not into six sectors, but into, you know, eight or ten or twelve sectors and, and have the same kind of pattern of hills and valleys alternating and get a more complicated type of parabolic point. <clears throat> all right, so these kinds of things were uh, quite well understood from the work of Euler. And, uh, and Mesnier came along and asked uh, the following rather interesting question. He said, okay, this is all very well. We've been talking so far about normal sections, about slicing a surface with a plane which contains the axis at a point. What happens if we slice with a non-normal section, a sort of a secant slice? Okay, so for example, in the simple case here, uh, you can see, um, okay, there's a sphere, okay, and let's suppose for the sake of argument that we're interested in this south pole here, that's the point that we're interested in with its tangent plane like this. Then the normal uh, directions goes through here, and the normal section is just a plane that goes through this north-south axis. There would be one such, uh, such sort of great circle or, or, or normal curvature thing. Now, in this case, the, there's not really a maximum or a minimum uh, curvature exactly. They're all equal. So all the normal sections at this point have exactly the same uh, curvature. 
Okay. So it's a little bit different. It's a kind of a special uh, situation where there's not a distinguished pair of directions. Okay. The two, um, the two principal curvatures are are equal, but there are no distinguished principal directions because basically the eigen spaces of dimension two. That's a special uh, kind of point. So we'll maybe give that a name. So uh, a point on a surface where the principal curvatures are equal are equal not just in size but also in sign in size and sign is called an umbilic point. An umbilic point. So for example, for a sphere, or in fact a plane, every point is umbilic. And uh, an important theorem of Jean-Baptiste Mesnier is the converse. So theorem is that if every point is umbilic, if every point on a surface is umbilic, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, then the surface is a sphere or a plane. That's the theorem of Mesny. By the way, uh, I might mention that these umbilic points are, are quite interesting. Okay, at some point it was appreciated that uh, a very interesting example is an ellipsoid. An ellipsoid with unequal axes. So something like x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared plus c squared over um, z squared over c squared equals 1, where a, b, and c are distinct. So some kind of football with uh, elliptic cross sections in all three directions. And you can see the cross section on the other one there. So it turns out that such an ellipsoid has exactly four umbilic points. Okay. So theorem, such an ellipsoid has four umbilic points. And uh, they are in two diagonally opposite pairs. And so, you know, maybe one is there, one is there, and then the other one is on the other side, and on the other side. We'll see those umbilic points uh, appearing uh, later on in, uh, well, in shortly. But now I want to talk about Mesnier's understanding of what happens when we take a, a surface, like going back to our sphere now, and slicing it at the point P, not with a plane that's containing the axis, but a general plane. 
Okay. So for example, you can perhaps see here that here's the uh, plane that's a normal section, but then I could also take a plane that goes through this point, maybe that one there, or that one there, or that one there, or that one there, and so on. Slicing out curves which are, well, going to have different kinds of curvature than the one uh, at this point here. And Musnier asked the question, what is the curvature of such a non-normal section at the point P? If we're interested in one of these curves, how do we compute its curvature? And the theorem that he discovered is very elegant and uh, sort of kind of a jewel in uh, this kind of differential geometry. So Mesnier's theorem is that if a non-normal uh, plane or section makes a spread S with the tangent plane at P, then the, the curvature of that section the curve, well, I should say the quadratic curvature, it's easier to give the formula for the quadratic cur curvature. The quadratic curvature which is just the square of the, the normal curvature. The, qu the quadratic curvature is K1 is K over S, where K is the quadratic curvature of the normal section in, in, uh, with the same tangent, is the quadratic curvature of the normal section with the same tangent line. So let me uh, draw the picture and I'll have to remind you what spread means. No, draw a more general thing. <clears throat> okay, so the, the, the picture is here is a, a surface and here's some point P. And we have a tangent plane at P. And then at, at that tangent plane, we have a certain tangent direction. Okay, so there's a fixed tangent direction. tangent direction at P. And now what we're interested in is slicing the surface with a plane that goes through P and also goes through that tangent direction. Of course there's the normal section which, which we could do and that's we've already been considering it. So that's the normal section which would have a, a normal Thing. But now we're interested in a, a slanted or a secant plane. Let's draw it in blue. That's still going through here, but is slanted in some direction like this. Still going through P and still going through this tangent line, but slanted. And so that it cuts out on the surface a different kind of curve. And we're interested in what is the curvature of that that, that green slice at the point P. So at P, the, uh, the curvature of the green thing, of the green curve is, uh, say, what we're calling K1. And what did we say, the vertical one. 
the curvature of that is what we're calling K. And the other ingredient is the spread between this plane and the, the tangent. And I'm going to denote that like this. Okay, so let me remind you about what spread is. So if you have two lines like this, the spread between them, this is from rational trigonometry, okay, is equal to a ratio of two quadrances. It's opposite quadrants, say Q, divided by hypotenuse quadrants R. Okay, so the spread S is defined as Q over R. In terms of angles, if this was an angle theta, you could say that S is equal to sine squared of the angle. Same thing. The spread is a number between 0 and, and 1. Sine Sorry? No, sine squared theta, because th these are quadrances. This is a quadrants, quadrants, ratio of quadrances. <clears throat> Mersenet's uh, theorem has another interpretation, and I might leave this as a problem for you. So problem show this uh, is equivalent to the statement that that all osculating circles to the surface S at P in the direction well let's get this direction name, let's call it V in the direction V lie on a sphere. So what do you mean all of those? So all, uh, this is equivalent to the statement, all oscillating circles, thanks. All oscillating circles to S at P in the direction V lie on a sphere. So in other words, that if we look at uh, things from here, and we're looking at all sections of the surface that pass through this, this fixed tangential line. We're getting all these different curves. If we draw the osculating circle of each one of these individual curves, they all end up lying on a sphere. It looks exactly like this. Okay. So there's a sphere which depends on this direction V that sits at the point P and such that if you slice it at, uh, at any, in any direction like this containing the direction V, then you get exactly the osculating circle of the slice of the surface. So that's a consequence of the, a little bit of the geometry associated to uh, this thing here, basically it's a consequence of this kind of geometry here, that if you have a, a, a circle, this is sort of a cross section, and this is 90 degrees first of all, and that this spread here is the same as that spread here. Okay, so well, let's, uh, let's try to prove Mesnier's theorem because it's such a lovely result. And it's a good application of the the kinds of ideas that we've been uh, developing, where we try to think about the parabolic approximation to a surface. <coughs> so, proof. Okay, so we're going to use, we use the fact that the surface S near P can be approximated up to quadratically by a normal paraboloid.
And that means that we can only, that means we can prove this for an, a paraboloid and then it will prove it for the surface. So we're going to prove the same fact for the, the paraboloid which is, has its vertex here at P and whose, uh, whose axis is in the same axis as the surface has. Alright, so what we're going to do is we're, we're basically simplifying things by replacing this general surface with a paraboloid, the, the basic approximation. So we can assume that our surface is, uh, say, 2z equals ax squared plus 2bxy plus cy squared. That's a particularly attractive form for a normal paraboloid where everything is uh, oriented up and down. And where we're going to choose the this tangential direction and the given tangential direction is say the x-axis. So there's the uh, axis that we're considering. So we're really interested in slicing this paraboloid with a plane that contains the x-axis. And uh, seeing what the curvature of the, the cross-section is. Okay, so how do we determine such a plane? Well, that's one direction, so we need another kind of direction. So in the yz axis, let's choose a direction where the, uh, the plane can, uh, can go. So maybe we'll go over one and up C. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the vector 0, 1, C. And this is the vector 1, 0, 0. So let's suppose that the plane is the span of uh, 1, 0, 0 and 0, 1, C. Uh, maybe I shouldn't use C, I'll, I'll use D because we're already using C for the equation of the paraboloid. D is how far up it'll go. Okay, that's going to sweep out a curve or intersect the paraboloid within a certain curve. Okay, it's sort of the cross section. A little bit hard to visualize uh, just on the blackboard without good graphics, but there it is. Okay, so how are we going to describe this um, curve. Well, we'll think of it as having two directions, one or two components, one in this direction and sort of essentially one in this direction. So a general point on this plane, a general point is of the form x times 1, 0, 0 plus say w times 0, 1, d. Okay, which is just uh, x, w, and w, d. What's the requirement that, uh, that this point lie on the paraboloid? So for this to lie on the paraboloid, we require, well, that it satisfies the, uh, the equation if we substitute it in. So let's just substitute it in. So 2 times WD equals A times X squared plus 2B times X times WD plus C times uh, W squared. Did I do that right? Uh, no D here. X times W. So X is being replaced with X. Uh, the Y is replaced, being replaced with W and the Z is being replaced with W times D. 
So this is a relationship between x and w that's required if we want this general point on this plane to lie on the paraboloid. And what we're interested in is what this relation looks like just near the point P or near x equals zero. If we know what x is, we'll be able to solve for w. Because this is a single relation that uh, relates x and w. So in fact, we can solve for w in terms of, of x. We could do that by a, a sort of a quadratic equation, but it's more efficient, perhaps, to think of just using a, a power series like we've been doing. So w is a function of x, so we'll write it out as a series, maybe alpha times x plus beta times x squared plus some higher terms. So near, near zero. So we have to plug that in here and see what alpha and beta are to give the relationship between x and w, which will guarantee that that, that slice actually lies on the paraboloid. All right, so if we do that, what do we get? We get two, w we said is alpha x plus beta x squared and other stuff, but I'm not gonna bother with the higher degree terms because we're only gonna go up to quadratic terms, so I just won't even write them down. Times d equals a x squared plus two b x times alpha x plus beta x squared plus c times w W is alpha x plus beta x squared all squared. And that is then, well, what can we deduce about what alpha and beta are? So we want this to be equal up to uh, powers, of, uh, powers of x. There's no constant term on either side. The power of uh, x to the one, there's an alpha here that's x, that's linear in x, and there's uh, nothing on the right-hand side that's linear in x. So that tells us that alpha has to equal zero, first of all. And then it's a question of comparing quadratic terms. So the quadratic term on this side will be two beta d, that's the coefficient of x squared on the left, and the coefficient of x squared on the right will be, there's an a from here, there's an x squared here, but we've just said alpha is equal to zero, so that's actually zero. And over here, the x squared term will have uh, an alpha squared in front, but we've said alpha is equal to zero. So in fact, it just reduces to two beta d equals a, telling us that beta equals a over 2d. So I've done that in two steps, looked at first of all the coefficient of x to conclude that alpha has to be zero, and then given that alpha is equal to zero, looking at the coefficient of x squared, and concluding that beta is a over 2d. All right, so now we know what, what this curve is. Yeah? Uh, if you equated the power for the x cubed and the x to the four, for the x to the four, would you get the beta to be zero then? Well, see, okay, so in terms of the higher powers, we're ignoring lots of, we're ignoring lots of cubic uh, things. We're ignoring uh, cubics here, and, and here, and here, but we're also really ignoring cubic terms in our original approximation, that we're approximating our surface with this paraboloid. Already at that level, we're, we're ignoring the cubic terms. So this is a whole story, sort of reducing everything to just the linear and the quadratic terms. It's not much to, of an exaggeration to say that's sort of the essence of the differential geometry that we're doing. We're looking at everything up to quadratic terms. All right, so now we, uh, we have this pleasant quadratic relationship between the variable in one direction and the variable in the other direction. So here we have these two directions, they're perpendicular. 
there's an x here and the w here, and we see that w is essentially a beta times uh, x squared, where beta is this number here. So we know what this thing looks like as a parabola. So if we remind ourselves what the curvature of a parabola is at a point, we can write down what the curvature is. Okay. So let's recall. All right, so recall that if we have a parabola, uh, say 2y equals ax squared, that that parabola had exactly curvature A. That's curvature A at L at the point zero, zero. So if I draw that parabola, so here's y equals, or 2y equals uh, ax squared. The curvature of this parabola can be obtained from the, if we're interested in the curvature, and we're, in, we're interested in sort of reading off what the curvature is, we can do it by finding some little triangle and looking at the, the two lengths here. But it's algebraically nicer if we actually look at the two quadrants. So let's call this uh, Q and R. Okay. So Q will be like X squared. And R is like uh, Y squared. Okay. So this equation, what we're saying here is that the, the quadratic curvature, which we are also, uh, which is A squared, is the same as from this uh, thing, it's 2y squared over x to the fourth, which is 2, uh, two all squared, I have to square it, 4y squared over x to the fourth, which is 4r over q squared. <coughs> so if you have a, a general parabola without any coordinates and you just have the parabola itself and you want to know what is, what is its curvature. What you do is you just draw a little segment of the curvature like this. You draw a little triangle. You calculate this quadrants and measure this quadrants, call it Q and R, and you take the ratio of 4 times R over Q squared. That's going to be the square of the curvature at this point, the quadratic curvature. It's a restatement of the, of the fact that the curvature of this thing is A. All right, so what did we have over here? So we had, go back to our diagram, and I'm going to take that plane that was originally slanting, and I'm going to write it on the board so we can see it a little bit more clearly. So here is the vector 1, 0, 0. That was one of the directions in the plane. And here is the other vector, which was 0, 1, D, which was the other direction. And we were looking at x times 1, 0, 0 plus w times uh, 0, 1, d. And in that plane, which is of course a slanted plane, there will be this cross section, which locally near 0 looks like a parabola. And so we can uh, calculate the curvature by essentially this kind of uh, reasoning. Let's draw a little uh, diagram. So here is maybe the point x, and then we have to go up a certain uh, amount. That's this point here. And so we should calculate this quadrants, and we should calculate this quadrants, call them q and r, and then we should calculate 4r over q squared. Okay, so what is Q? Q is obviously X squared. What is R? Well, R is the quadrants of this, this thing. Okay, so R is... Mm -hmm. 
So R is W squared times the quadrants of this, which is uh, 1 plus D squared. Now what did we say W was? We said W was equal to beta times uh, X. Beta times X squared, all squared, times 1 plus D squared. And beta, we concluded, was A over 2D. So this is A over 2D all squared times X to the fourth times 1 plus D squared. And now we can put these things together to calculate the, the curvature. So the quadratic curvature, K, which is going to be 4 capital R over Q squared. Uh, so there's a 4. Uh, this thing is an A squared. There'll be a 4D squared on the bottom. There'll be an X to the fourth. But that will cancel with the uh, Q squared, which is also X to the fourth. And then it'll just be 1 plus D squared. And the fours also cancel, and we get A squared divided by D squared over 1 plus D squared. And that's A squared over S. Or that's K. I guess it's K1 that we're calculating. That's K over uh, S. Because the normal curvature is of the paraboloid that we are considering. And the paraboloid was 2z equals ax squared plus 2bxy plus cy squared. In the uh, x direction, with y is 0, we're just going to get ax squared. And so the, the normal curvature is actually a, and the, the, norm, the quadratic normal curvature is a squared. And why is this d squared over 1 plus d squared equals the s? Because our diagram that we, we drew was this one. We said this was d. And so this quadrant is actually d squared. And then by Pythagoras, this quadrant will be 1 plus d squared. And so the spread s is d squared over 1 plus d squared. It's exactly the spread that's appearing there on the corner. All right, so, so notice, uh, you know, that I haven't used or I managed to avoid any transcendental quantities. I try to do that if I can. So I have more confidence in things. And it also means that it has the potential to be more general. We can now say, well, this probably works over a finite field or probably extends to a red or a green geometry if we do things uh, carefully. Okay, so Meusnier was the first of our uh, three Frenchmen that we'll, we'll have a look at. So next time we're going to carry on with this, this very fertile era of investigation and talk about Monge and Dupin's uh, contributions, some of their contributions. See you then.